In the last unit, we discussed screw-type positive displacement pumps like this one. We talked about their purpose, their parts, and some of their maintenance problems. We also looked at mechanical seals, their design, and the way they work. In this unit, we'll apply what we've learned about screw pumps and mechanical seals to an actual maintenance situation. We'll go through step-by-step -step procedures for performing a pump overhaul. We'll tear this pump down, clean it and inspect it, and replace any worn or damaged parts we might find. And then, we'll reassemble the pump and put it back into service. Finally, we'll spend a few minutes demonstrating the procedure for replacing a mechanical seal. Okay, let's get started on the pump overhaul. Earlier today, the pump operator reported problems with this unit. And when the maintenance foreman checked it over, he found two problems. Fluid leaking from the inboard mechanical seals and noisy overheated timing gears. When the foreman decided to pull the pump for an overhaul, the operator had the pump tagged out. Then the mechanic was called in. He drained the oil from the pump and disconnected the unit from its motor and piping. He was also careful to remove the gauges and piping nipples so that they wouldn't get damaged. We then brought the pump here to the shop where there's plenty of room to work. Of course, if a pump is too large or too difficult to move, you'll have to overhaul it where it is, which often means working in some pretty tight spots. Now, before we start the actual overhaul, we have to make sure that we're prepared. Do we have the tools that we need? Do we have an assortment of pans for holding the pump parts and for collecting the oil we still have to drain from the timing gear housing? Of course, we also have to know the procedure to follow for disassembling, cleaning, inspecting, and reassembling the pump. For any pump that you overhaul, the best source of information is the manufacturer's instruction manual. It lists the specifications of the pump and outlines the procedures you'll need to follow. To give us an idea of what an overhaul entails, let's begin by reviewing the parts of this pump and the procedure we'll follow in disassembling it. We'll start here with the timing gear housing. First, draining the oil and then unbolting and removing the housing itself. That will expose the timing gears, allowing us to remove them also. Next, we'll take the coupling off the inboard end of the shaft. Then, we'll remove the bearing bracket from either end of the casing. Because the bearings will come off with the bearing brackets, all that will be left will be to remove the mechanical seals which are located at either end of the rotors and then pull the rotors out of the casing. With the pump completely disassembled, we'll be able to clean the various parts and inspect them for signs of wear and damage. When we've replaced any damaged parts that we find, we'll put the pump back together again by reversing the procedures we use to disassemble it. Basically, that covers the procedure we'll follow. So, now that we have our tools together and have a general idea of the steps involved, we can begin by draining the oil from the timing gear housing. Use a wrench to loosen the drain plug in the bottom of the housing. You can then remove the plug by hand, allowing the oil to drain into the pan you've already put in place. Be sure to set the plug somewhere safe. If you drop it into the oil pan, you could lose it when you dispose of the oil. While the oil drains, begin loosening the timing gear housing nuts. As you see here, you can get to these nuts a lot more easily if the housing hangs over the edge of the table. The overhang gives you room to maneuver the wrench, especially when working on the bottom nuts. Once these nuts are loosened, they can be backed off the rest of the way by hand. When the last nut is removed, slide the timing gear housing away from the bearing bracket. 
As you remove the larger parts of the pump, it's a good idea to set them in a cleaning tray. This puts them in a safe place, out of the way until you're ready to clean them. You're now ready to remove the timing gears themselves. The timing gears are usually held in place by a retaining nut and lock washer combination. To remove this nut and washer, you'll first need a hammer and a drift or punch. Begin by folding the ear of the lock washer out of the groove in the retaining nut. More than one washer ear might be folded into the nut. If so, be sure to fold all of them back out of the way. This will free the retaining nut, enabling you to remove it. Before going any further, you can give yourself adequate working room and prevent an accidental spill by moving the pan of oil out of the way. Following good housekeeping practices like this also makes cleanup after the overhaul a lot easier. To remove the retaining nut and washer, first loosen the retaining nut with a spanner wrench. When the retaining nut is broken free, Back it off the rest of the way by hand. Do the same with the other retaining nut, removing both sets of nuts and washers from the shafts. Now, before you can remove the timing gears, you'll have to get some help. This is because the teeth of the gears are meshed together, making it impossible to remove the gears one at a time. And removing them both at once usually requires a second set of hands. Begin by putting a pan within reach to receive the gears. Then position a center finder on the end of one of the shafts and attach a gear puller to the first gear. Tighten the gear puller just enough to hold it in place. Do the same for the second gear. First, position a center finder on the end of the shaft, then attach a second gear puller. When both gear pullers are in position, each of you can attach a socket wrench to the spindle of one of the pullers and begin backing off the gears. It's important to pull the gears off evenly. This requires coordinating your movements so that the gear pullers move together. Pulling the gears evenly prevents the teeth from locking or getting hung up. When the gears are backed off far enough so that they're loose and can be pulled off by hand, remove the gear pullers. Then remove the gears, being certain that the keys that hold them in place end up in the pan. Inspect the gears carefully. As we suspected, these gears are damaged and will have to be replaced. The next step is to remove the outboard bearing bracket. There's usually an alignment dowel pin on either side of the bracket that must be tapped out. First the pin on one side is removed, and then the pin on the other side. Now you can loosen and remove the bearing bracket nuts located on the inboard end of the bracket. When you've removed the last nut, the bearing bracket will be free of the pump casing. As you slide the bracket away from the casing, avoid bumping the studs or the mechanical seals located on the shaft.
It's a good idea to take the bearing bracket directly to the cleaning tray, since you'll be cleaning it later anyway. That takes care of the timing gear housing, the timing gears, and the outboard bearing bracket. Before going on with the disassembly procedure, review the material we've covered so far. In the last segment, we exposed the outboard mechanical seals by removing the timing gear housing, the timing gears, and the outboard bearing bracket. We're now ready to remove these seals. When you've cleaned any surface dirt and excess lubricant off both shafts, you should be able to remove the rotating carbon face, the cartridge, and the spring by hand. Avoid touching the contact surface of the carbon face. Dirt, grit, even the moisture of your skin can damage the carbon surface and prevent it from properly sealing the pump. Also, remember to remove the backing plate that seats the spring against the collar or drive ring. And protect the parts of the seal especially the carbon surface, by wrapping them in a clean rag and setting them aside in the pan. The final rotating part of the seal is the collar or drive ring. It's usually attached to the shaft by one or more set screws. Loosen these set screws with an Allen wrench. You may have to rotate the shaft to get clear access to the screws. Once the set screws are loose, however, the collar can be slipped off the end of the shaft and set aside. Use the same procedure to remove the rotating parts of the second mechanical seal. First, remove the carbon face, cartridge, spring, and backing plate from the shaft. Wrap these parts in a clean rag. Then loosen the set screws in the collar or drive ring. And slide it off the shaft. A quick wipe with a clean rag finishes the job at this end of the rotors. You can now deal with the coupling hub at the inboard end of the power rotor. In many cases, the hub is held in place by one or more set screws. It's extremely important that you remember to loosen these set screws. Otherwise, when the gear puller is attached and pressure is applied, the set screws will rake across the shaft, leaving deep gouges. When all set screws are loosened, you can attach the puller. In this case, we're using a bearing puller that has a backing plate. The backing plate fits behind the coupling hub to evenly distribute the pulling force over the entire surface of the hub. This type of bearing puller greatly reduces the chances of damaging the hub during removal. Of course, for the bearing puller to work properly, it has to be set up properly. This means lining up the backing plate against the back of the hub and tightening the nuts into position 
to maintain the correct fit. Then, the two bolts are attached. One goes on the right-hand side of the hub, and the other goes on the left-hand side of the hub. Next, the strong back is attached between the two bolts, with its jacking bolt and a center finder positioned on the end of the shaft. Like the other puller we saw, this type is also operated by a socket wrench attached to the end of a jacking bolt. In addition, when using this type of bearing puller, a second wrench is usually required to steady the puller and to prevent the nut located on the jacking bolt from turning. Be certain to keep this second wrench attached to the nut. If it slips off, it could damage the jacking bolt threads. Continue to operate the puller until the hub comes loose. then slide it off the end of the shaft. You can then disassemble the bearing puller and put the coupling parts in the cleaning tray. The key that holds the hub on the shaft must be removed next and set in the pan with the other parts. Okay, now before we can remove the inboard bearing bracket, we have to make some room. Set the gear puller and the other tools aside. Always keep your tools nearby, but not in the way of your work. Don't forget to clean up any oil that may have leaked out of the pump. and be sure any loose pump parts are placed in the pan. Now you can go ahead and remove the bearing bracket. Follow the same procedure you followed for the outboard bracket, starting with the removal of the dowel pins on either side. Next, with a pan in position, remove the drain plug underneath the bearing housing. Allow the oil to drain completely. Then loosen and remove the bearing bracket nuts. You may have to use a pair of jacking bolts to separate the bracket from the casing. If so, turn each one about one quarter turn at a time. This will ensure that the bracket is moved evenly. Whatever method you use, be careful when removing the bearing bracket not to damage the studs, the mechanical seals, or the shaft. Once the bracket is set aside, remove the rotors themselves. They should slip out of the casing fairly easily. Because the rotors are so important to the proper function of the pump, you must protect them against damage. Be careful not to drop them. And when you set them down, set them down gently. The mechanical seals on the inboard end of each rotor should be removed the same way as the outboard seals were. First, pull off the carbon sealing face, the cartridge, and the spring, and then the backing plate. Protect these parts by wrapping them carefully in a clean rag. And set them in a pan. Repeat this procedure for the last mechanical seal. But before you remove the collars or drive rings, Measure the distance from each one to the end of the shaft. 
These measurements will help you put these parts back in the same position later on. When you have both measurements, remove the drive rings by loosening the set screws and slipping the rings off the shafts. That completes disassembly. As we'll see in the next segment, we now have to clean the various pump parts as thoroughly as possible and inspect them for signs of wear or damage. Before we begin cleaning and inspection though, take a few minutes to read segment two of your text and answer the questions. So far, we've succeeded in tearing the pump down but before we can inspect the various pump parts, they have to be thoroughly cleaned. There's no strict order to follow in cleaning and inspecting the parts. But since inspection of the rotors is the most complicated procedure involving careful measurements, we'll take care of the rotors first. If during disassembly, you put some of the larger pump parts in the cleaning tray, as we did, you'll first have to take them out of the tray and put them somewhere safe until it's their turn to be clean. With the larger parts out of the way, carefully put one of the rotors in the cleaning tray. What's the next step? Right, safety goggles and rubber gloves. Remember that the solvents you're using, even though non-toxic, can still irritate your skin and your eyes. Okay, now using a soft bristle brush, wash all dirt and oil off the rotor. Clean both rotors this way, getting them as clean as possible. When you're finished with the second rotor, you'll want to inspect both of them. Set up a pair of V-blocks with enough space between them so that you can suspend one of the rotors over the table. Next, take the rotor from the cleaning tray and position it on the V-blocks as you see here. What we're going to do here is take a runout reading. A runout reading taken with a dial indicator tells you whether or not the shaft is perfectly round and perfectly straight as it should be. Position the dial indicator so that its stem presses against the surface of one end of the rotor. Then set the dial indicator at zero. Rotate the rotor slowly, keeping your eye on the face of the dial. A slow movement of the needle away from zero indicates a bent or out of round shaft. A quick flicker of the needle usually indicates a burr on the shaft. When you've taken a runout reading at one end, move the dial indicator to a point on the other end of the rotor and repeat the procedure. If you find that the shaft is out of round, report it to your supervisor. The shaft may have to be replaced. The next important step is to inspect the lands. Remember that the timing gears in this pump were damaged. This could have caused the rotors to bang against each other or against the walls of the casing during operation. So check the lands carefully. If they're damaged, they won't be able to properly seal the discharge from the suction, and they may have to be replaced. When you finish inspecting both rotors, set them aside on a clean, lint-free rag, and you can go ahead and put the V-blocks away. The seal plates that contain the stationary faces of the seals can now be removed from both bearing brackets and inspected. We already know that one set of stationary faces will have to be replaced. Begin by removing the old gasket from the end of the bearing bracket. Then set the bracket on its end and begin loosening the nuts 
on the bolts that hold the seal plate in position. There are usually two of these nut and bolt combinations on either side of the seal plate. Once the first two nuts are loosened, the bolts can be swung down and out of the way. Turn the bearing bracket around and repeat this procedure for the fasteners on the other side of the seal plate. When all four bolts have been moved, you can slide the seal plate out of the bearing bracket. Of course, before you can inspect these parts, they have to be thoroughly cleaned. So put the seal plate and the bearing bracket in the cleaning tray. And don't forget the next step, your safety goggles and rubber gloves. Again, use solvent and a soft bristle brush to clean the parts thoroughly. When the bracket and seal plate are clean, set them on the clean rag along with the rotors. Then do the same for the other bearing bracket. Finally, clean the parts of the coupling, including the key, and all other small parts that you removed from the pump. Get in the habit of laying out the parts on a clean rag. That way they'll stay clean until you reassemble them. Also, use solvent and a brush on the timing gear housing. The next step is to inspect the bearings which are located in the bearing brackets. Remember, the bearings must be in good condition for the pump to operate correctly. Rotate the bearings a few times. They should rotate smoothly without any drag or looseness. Also check for foreign matter such as dirt or grit that could cause excessive wear during normal operation of the pump. Repeat this procedure for the other bearing bracket. As we mentioned before, the worn stationary sealing faces have to be removed from the seal plate that we took from the inboard bearing bracket. One way to do this is to tap the stationary faces out with a hammer and punch. Even if this stationary face were in good condition, it would have to be replaced along with the other parts of the leaky seal. An old stationary face can't be used with a new seal. Now you can clean the casing itself. Remember, whenever you use a hoist, make sure you balance the load properly and follow all plant rigging and safety procedures. All inside and outside surfaces of the casing must be cleaned thoroughly. Only if you've removed all dirt, grease, and oil will you be able to make a proper inspection. In addition, Cleaning ensures that no foreign matter remains in the pump to cause damage later on. Following cleaning, return the casing to its place on the table. When you have the casing where you want it, go ahead and disconnect the rig. Remember, though, to raise the lower block out of the way so you won't bump into it later on. Then remove the shackles, eye bolts, and any other hardware that you use to connect the casing to the hoist. Remember, these parts are tools, and they should be treated with the same care as your other tools. And, like other tools, they have a habit of walking off by themselves if you don't store them properly. So keep the parts together 
where you'll be able to find them the next time you need them. Next, use a clean, lint-free rag to wipe the bore inside the casing. This not only dries the walls of the bore, but also removes any traces of dirt or oil that may be left. Remember that the timing gears in this pump were damaged. This could have caused the rotors to bang around inside the casing, damaging the smooth surface of the bore. So feel for ridges and gouges that could affect the close tolerance between the lands and the walls of the bore. If you do find that the bore is damaged, report it to your supervisor and take whatever action he recommends. Also, check the inside walls of the suction and discharge ports for signs of wear and for any traces of foreign matter that you may have missed during cleaning. After completing inspection of the casing, remove the bearing bracket studs on both sides. Use the proper tools and take special care to avoid damaging the threads. Finally, Stone the ends of the casing and the suction and discharge flanges. You want to get smooth, even surfaces so that the pump can be properly sealed. That completes disassembly, cleaning, and inspection. We now know which parts must be replaced. The timing gears and two of the mechanical seals. Otherwise, our inspection showed that the parts of the pump are ready to be put back together. In a moment, we'll see the procedures for reassembling the pump and installing the new parts. But first, read through segment three of your text and review the material with your instructor. By the time you've finished cleaning and inspecting all the pump parts, you're ready to put the pump back together. Now, reassembly is basically disassembly in reverse. However, there are certain things to be careful of along the way, and that's what we'll be emphasizing in this segment. Before starting reassembly, you should have ordered and received any replacement parts you need. In addition, if preformed gaskets are not available, you'll have to make new gaskets to fit the pump. As you can see, we've already replaced the studs in the ends of the casing. We're now ready to install the rotors. It's good practice to put a small amount of clean, light oil into the casing to reduce friction between the rotors and the bore. Coat the entire inside surface by spreading the oil with either a clean brush or a clean, lint-free rag. In this way, you'll form a lubricating film that will protect both the bore and the rotors when you slip the rotors into place. There are two things to remember when installing the rotors. First, be certain they're properly aligned, that the lands are meshed together correctly. Second, when fitting the rotors into the bore, hold them close together and avoid bumping them against the studs or the lip of the casing. If properly lined up, the rotors should slide easily into the casing. You're now ready to install the casing gaskets and the mechanical seal collars or drive ring. Set the gasket in position over the studs. The next step is to install a drive ring on each shaft. Because the placement of these rings is so important to the proper function of the mechanical seals, you must be certain to position them correctly. 
measure the distance from each drive ring to the end of its respective shaft. Move the rings if necessary until your measurements match those you took during disassembly. Then, tighten the set screws in both rings. It's important that the set screws be tightened enough to hold the rings in their measured position. Otherwise, when the mechanical seal springs are installed and compressed against them, the rings will slip and the seal will lose the tension it needs to properly seal the shaft and the casing. With the drive rings mounted on the shaft, you can begin to install the parts of the new mechanical seal. Remember that both the metal sealing face and the carbon sealing face can be damaged by oil or dirt on your hands. So even when removing the new parts from their box, use a clean rag to handle them. First, install the stationary metal face into the seal plate. Using the clean rag to protect the surface, press it down firmly into the plate as far as it will go. This ensures a good, tight seal. Some stationary faces must be locked into place with a small pin. If this is true of the pump you're working on, you'll have to align a hole in the stationary face with a matching hole in the seal plate. Okay, with the stationary face installed, mount the rotating parts on the shaft, starting with the backing plate. Mount the spring against the backing plate. Then install the cartridge that's designed to hold the carbon face. Because this cartridge should fit the shaft snugly, you may have to force it into position by twisting it as you push it. Then slide the carbon face into the cartridge. When you finish with the first replacement seal, repeat the procedure for the second one. Install the metal sealing face in the seal plate and mount the rotating parts on the shaft. Then pour some clean, light oil over each stationary metal sealing face in the seal plate. The oil will help reduce friction. Next, set the new gasket in position. Then, mount the seal plate in the bearing bracket. Be certain the plate is installed correctly. When the bracket is mounted on the casing, the metal sealing faces must be in contact with the carbon faces. This means that the seal plate must face in the proper direction and the slots in the sides of the plate must line up with the bolts. Before mounting the bearing bracket on the pump casing, coat the studs with a lubricant recommended by the manufacturer. Lubricating the studs makes turning the nuts easier, as well as helping to prevent corrosion. You're now ready to put the bearing bracket in place. Again, be careful not to bump the studs or the mechanical seals when doing this. To get the bearing bracket in its proper position, install the dowel pins on either side of the casing. You may have to shift the bracket up and down slightly to get the pin into place. 
Then, tap the pin with a small hammer until it's just about flush with the surface of the bracket. Repeat this procedure for the pin on the other side, tapping until it's just about flush. Next, put the bearing bracket nuts onto the studs. You can use a wrench to tighten them. After the last bracket nut is tightened, make your final adjustment to the seal plate. This adjustment is important. It ensures that the metal sealing surfaces and the carbon sealing surfaces are correctly aligned to form the best possible seal. That completes reassembly of the inboard end of the pump, including the installation of new mechanical seals. Since the mechanical seals on the outboard end were in good shape, we simply reinstalled them. Then we followed the same procedure we just saw in mounting the outboard bearing bracket on the casing. Now we're ready to install the new timing gears. Begin by preparing the shafts. This means returning the surface of the shafts to like new condition. Polishing them with a crocus cloth is a good way of removing minor imperfections or blemishes. But if you find any large burrs on the shaft, you'll have to use a fine tooth file to remove them. Of course, filing or polishing the shafts creates tiny loose particles of metal. These particles must be prevented from entering and ruining the bearings. One way of getting rid of these particles is to set up a pan under both shafts and pour solvent directly over them. Use the solvent that collects in the pan to give the shafts a thorough cleaning. Then dry the shafts with a clean rag. Again, lubrication is important. Use a recommended lubricant to coat the place on each shaft where the gear will be seated. This will make the job of mounting the timing gears easier. If the pump is equipped with spacers that provide a clearance between the timing gears and the casing, install them next. In this pump, they have to be set right up against the inside race of the bearing. Then, set the keys in their keyways on the shafts. If you forget this step, you might start the pump only to wonder why the timing gears and rotors won't spin. Be sure the gears are properly lined up before mounting them. Their teeth should mesh and their keyways should line up with the position of the keys on the shafts. In addition, any witness marks, if there are any, must be matched. When the gears are mounted firmly against the spacers, slip a lock washer on the end of each shaft. Then, install the retaining nuts. Be certain, however, that you first lubricate the threads on the shaft. Turn the retaining nuts on by hand first. Then finish tightening them with a spanner wrench. As you finish tightening each nut, check to be sure it lines up with the lock washer. Then 
fold at least one ear of the washer into one of the grooves along the surface of the retaining nut. Turn the gears once or twice to be sure both the gears and the bearings rotate freely. The final step in reassembling the outboard end is to mount the timing gear housing. First, set the gasket in place over the studs. Then lubricate the studs, just as you lubricated the bearing bracket studs on either side of the casing. Being careful of the studs and the timing gears, slide the housing over the shafts, guiding the studs into the holes in the bearing bracket. While holding the housing with one hand, turn a pair of nuts onto the top two studs. Tighten these nuts just enough so that they can hold the housing in position while you attach and tighten the other nuts. When all the nuts are in place, tighten them alternately to ensure a snug, even fit between the outboard bearing bracket and the housing. All that remains now is to install the drain plug into the bottom of the timing gear housing. Now you can fill the timing gear housing with clean oil. This oil is vital to the gears. Using the proper lubricant reduces friction and prevents excessive wear. When the timing gear housing is full, go ahead and fill the oil reservoir for the inboard bearings. Check the oil level indicator on the face of the bracket to be sure enough oil has been added. And if this pump were being returned to service, we'd have to mount the coupling on the end of the shaft. The overhaul would then be complete and we could attach the rigging and take the pump out of the shop. When it was back online, we would reconnect it to its bed plate, motor, and piping and of course, run an operational test. Although we've seen the overhaul of only one type of screw pump, you'll find that the procedures we covered will apply to most types of screw pumps you'll be working on. This is because their parts and the way they operate are basically the same. But there are exceptions. We all run into situations where we're not sure of what procedure to follow. When this happens, go back to the source, the manufacturer's instruction manual. Most likely, the information you need is right here. Of course, it's one thing to watch an overhaul and quite another thing to actually do one yourself. With some practice and experience, however, pump maintenance will become second nature to you. So, let's start that practice and experience right now. Open your text and read the material we've just covered. Then, perform any practice exercises that your instructor recommends. In a moment, we'll come back to see how to replace a mechanical seal without performing a complete pump overhaul. During the overhaul we completed in the last segment, we replaced two worn mechanical seals with new ones. But if leaky seals had been the only problem with this pump, we wouldn't have had to do a complete overhaul. Instead, we would have simply removed the bearing bracket and replaced the seals. You'll often be asked to replace bad seals without overhauling an entire pump.
In this segment, we'll focus on the procedure for doing this. To show you the variety of screw pumps and mechanical seals you might come across, we'll be working on this three-rotor screw pump. It has no timing gears. This makes removal of the rotor a simpler process. Since it's already here in the shop, we don't have to worry about tagging procedures and taking the pump offline. All that's already been done. We do, however, have to be sure we have all the tools we need. And of course, we need the right replacement seal. Any other information we may need can usually be found in the manufacturer's instruction manual. For this seal replacement, the mechanic has an apprentice assisting him. They begin by loosening the four bolts that hold the end plate to the casing. Then a speed wrench is used to remove the four bolts, freeing the end plate. Because there is no bearing bracket on this pump, the end plate is the only part that must be disassembled before the power rotor can be removed. The end plate is slipped off the end of the shaft and set aside with the casing bolts. Then the power rotor is gently drawn out of the pump. Having assistance, helps prevent the rotor from banging against the lip of the casing. A table vise has already been set up to accept the rotor. Copper sheathing covers the jaws of the vise, preventing them from marring the precisely machined surface of the lands. The jaws should be tightened firmly enough to keep the rotor from shifting around. Before the mechanical seal can be removed, the bearing must be taken off the shaft. First, the split retaining ring which holds the bearing in place must be taken apart and set aside. Since the ring is split, remember to keep both halves together. Then a bearing puller can be attached with its jaws gripping the seal plate and stationary face of the mechanical seal. We want to apply pressure to the seal plate rather than the bearing itself in order to minimize the chances of damaging the bearing. When the bearing puller is properly lined up, you can begin backing off the bearing, the bearing spacer, and stationary parts of the seal. Having someone steady the puller will help prevent the rotor from shifting in the vise. When the bearing, bearing spacer, and seal plate have been moved back an inch or so, the inner split retaining ring will be exposed. It must be removed before the other parts can be pulled any farther. Split retaining rings are often difficult to work with. Assembling and disassembling them easily requires a good amount of practice. Just be sure to remove both halves of the ring before trying to pull the other parts off the rest of the way. You can now finish pulling off the bearing, bearing spacer, and stationary parts of the seal. Use the puller until the bearing slides back far enough so that it's loose on the shaft. Remove the bearing and check to see that it spins smoothly. Then remove the bearing spacer and the worn stationary face and seal plate and set them in the cleaning tray. Remember that dirt and grit can ruin the bearing, so carefully wipe any foreign matter off the bearing and set the bearing aside where it will stay clean. 
Next, slide the old rotating carbon face off the shaft. Look carefully for signs that might indicate why the seal failed. Signs like cracking or excessive wear. Finally, you can remove the cartridge. Loosen the set screws that hold the collar in place and slide the cartridge off the end of the shaft. Check the O-ring inside the cartridge for cracks or flat spots that could have allowed the seal to leak. With all the parts of the seal stripped from the shaft, Wipe the shaft with a clean rag and inspect it for grooves or scoring, especially where the collar was attached. By this time, the other parts have been cleaned and are ready for reassembly. Set the parts of a worn seal aside, except for the end plate and bearing spacer. Then you can begin reassembling the rotor by installing the new seal. Remember that the new seal parts might not be exactly the same shape as the worn ones. For example, in this case, the new stationary face and seal plate are slightly different than the ones we took off. Start by pressing the new stationary metal sealing face and O-ring into the new seal plate. Protect the polished metal surface by handling it only with a clean rag. Then install the rotating parts of the new seal on the shaft. First, the new collar and cartridge assembly, which contains the spring mechanism. It keeps the carbon and metal sealing surfaces in tight contact. Next, the rubber O-ring that fits against the spring mechanism inside the cartridge. The last rotating part is the carbon sealing face itself. Before installing it, Pour a little clean oil on the face that will touch the metal sealing surface. This thin coat of oil will eliminate unnecessary friction and prevent wear during break-in. The carbon face is then slid into position against the O-ring inside the cartridge. With all the rotating parts now in position, install the stationary face and seal plate against the carbon face. All the parts of the new mechanical seal are now in place. Next, the bearing spacer is slid onto the shaft. Then the split retaining ring that forms the inner seal for the bearing should be wiped clean and assembled in its groove on the shaft. As we mentioned before, assembling split retaining rings is often tricky. Even with experience, it might take you several tries to get the halves properly locked together. Before pressing the bearing into position, lubricate its place on the shaft. This will prevent excessive friction between the bearing and the shaft when the bearing is installed. Finally, slide the bearing onto the shaft as far as it will go. Now one method for installing the bearing is to use a length of soft pipe whose diameter is equal to the diameter of the inside race of the bearing. Holding the spacer in position, set the pipe against the inner race and tap it into place. Just be sure the pipe stays lined up against the inner race or you may end up having to replace the bearing. With the bearing firmly seated against the inboard retaining ring, the second retaining ring can be installed in the groove in the shaft. 
With that done, adjust the position of the collar and cartridge so that the spring mechanism inside the cartridge exerts the right amount of pressure on the rotating carbon surface. Like many other mechanical seals, this one has a load line on its cartridge. When the plate attached to the spring is lined up with this load line, you know that the right amount of tension is being exerted. You can then tighten the set screws in the collar, locking the rotating parts of the seal in place. When all the set screws have been tightened, the rotor is completely reassembled and ready to be installed in the pump. Loosen the jaws of the vise and lift the rotor out. Again, be careful not to bump the rotor against the lip of the casing. Guide the rotor in gently, turning it, if necessary, to help it mesh with the idlers inside. Complete the job by installing the end plate. That completes the basic procedure for mechanical seal replacement. As you saw, it's not difficult, but it does demand time and close attention to detail. Of course, not all pumps and not all mechanical seals are identical to the ones we've worked with in this unit. But most pumps and seals are enough alike so that a lot of what we've covered will apply to the screw pumps and mechanical seals you'll work with. Just remember that good maintenance practices aren't learned overnight. They're developed with practice and experience. As you work with experienced maintenance mechanics, Pay attention to whatever information and suggestions they might give you. Their expertise is a valuable tool for building your career on safe and proper maintenance principles.